fund. Okay. Got it. That's so that's comes out of printed money. Awesome. Vivek, thank you so much for joining us again. The world has yeah, changed good to be the on, last man. 24 hours. It has. Um, you know, I just, uh, thanks for the folks who sent me a message. I, uh, I think it's a great group you guys have. And, uh, I just published a piece in the wall street journal, uh, uh the opinion page, maybe a couple hours ago, uh, before the nose, before this news broke now. But, you know, I got to say, um, you know, I, I understand that they've very delicately managed where the funds are coming from. So as to say, technically, it's not going to come from a taxpayer pocket, but there is no free lunch. And I think that the, the hard question that everyone's going to have to answer is why bother having the charade of a cap on FDIC if they're really we're going to treat it when there's certain darlings who end up being the ones that needing to go put their hand back in the cookie jar who actually need it above the cap. Instead, just pre-specify it ex ante to everybody that the cap is something higher than the made-up $250,000 figure we applied. And, and it frustrates me to watch, and I think they succeeded. So kudos to the Silicon Valley establishment for actually getting what they needed to get done done in their hour of need. You know what? The, the, the actual social insurance policies they had bought for years paid off. But you know what actually happened is that in their hour of need, they got effectively – a bunch of tech startups that are banking with Silicon Valley Bank got bailed out for poor decision making for, you know, I think something that they shouldn't have been rewarded for. And the reason is that had this happened in a different situation where they hadn't mongered the, the fear of actually spreading a financial crisis, the whole justification of this bank being subject to a less stringent regulatory regime was – precisely because under under the cap for where the more stringent Dodd-Frank rules kicked in because it was not a, supposed to be a systemic risk that they created. So the irony is that the very argument that Silicon Valley Bank would not have created a systemic risk was invoked right in their hour of need to actually result in what was really a lowercase b bailout. And, and I think that you got to separate for all of the people who were talking about this triggering a national epidemic of a bank run. You could handle that separately. Right. What, and, I, and that's what my whole Wall Street Journal piece was about is the FDIC could prospectively temporarily raise the amount that was insured. The Federal Reserve has the ability to be the lender of re last resort against good assets. There's a lot of things that were fundamentally different about Silicon Valley Bank than other banks across this country. And also, by the way, many of the people who were banking with Silicon Valley, I mean, I know how this works. They get venture debt term sheets. They get special relationships with Silicon Valley that give those founders and the owners of those companies added skew equity upside that the taxpayer does not participate in. But when the time comes, you know, when their when their bell tolls, the public is still there for the downside risk. And so I just think it's a travesty. I think it will erode trust. People wonder where populism comes from. This is where it comes from. It comes from faux free marketeers who, when times are good, will uh, let the money rain from on high. But when the spigot stops you know, effectively want special treatment outside of the rules that were pre-specified. And if those were the rules or those weren't the rules, why not just say that? Why operate under the charade that everybody else has to assume that it's $250,000 maximum, but when it's a favored darling, somehow those rules are out the window. So I think if you want to know where populism comes from, this is exhibit A. We learned it. We see it on full display. And, you know, there you have your answer. And, and so it's fascinating because it, this is all in the context of the proposal from President Biden, his proposal is out. Uh, you know, obviously, you're a presidential candidate uh, and uh, not the not the biggest fan of Biden's, but wanted to give you the chance to say, OK, how does this all fit together in terms of his proposal, which does aim to, uh, you know, shore up Medicare, shore up other entitlements, but to increase taxes along the way? One of your competitors on the Republican side, Nikki Haley, came out this morning and said that everything should be on the table. Do you agree? So here's the way I look at it is I think it is a false debate that the GOP and the Democrats have both fallen into and playing small ball between raising taxes and cutting entitlements to deal with the deficit. Right. So you got Trump on one hand who you know, a lot of Republicans don't like to talk about this, but absolutely spent a lot of money and contributed to the deficit that some of those very Republicans now like to complain about. But then I think you have a bunch of classical conservatives who like to play small ball like a bunch of accountants talking about spending cuts with Democrats talking about the only thing they know how to talk about, which is raising taxes. I think that there's a third way, and it's amazing to me that nobody talks about it, which is restoring GDP growth in this country, right? GDP growth, I, I said this in the last space we were on, which is 
it's been it was over four percent for all of our national history until the early 1970s when a few things went awry both culturally and with the federal reserve going off the gold standard and expanding its remit to playing the kinds of games they've been playing for the last couple of decades by trying to play god according to balancing unemployment with inflation which they've done a pretty poor job of doing anyway but that's, I think, how we actually set an economic agenda that's centered on GDP growth. You hear from one party about spending cuts. You hear from the other party about higher taxes. Why is nobody talking about GDP growth? And anything that's on my train, I'm, I, I view myself as a freight train, and if you're on the track, I'm going to run I run through whatever obstacle that is to GDP growth. And if that's the climate agenda, let it be the climate agenda. If it's the anti-nuclear agenda, which is the most puzzling, I'd be running through the anti-nuclear agenda. But I think that we need to unleash actual GDP growth and productivity. We can grow our way out of this rather than playing small ball as accountants with spectacles as classical conservatives or, you know, for that matter, just go into re- the old liberal refrain of raising taxes. There's a better way. So yesterday you had recommended, and I think in your article, I'm assuming it was similar, which was that in this situation, coming in, what they're calling, just, to, just so you know the, the talking points, the talking points right now are they're calling this a backstop. By the way, a very interesting uh, use of words, but it's not been called a bailout. Of course, do you not. think that it is a bailout? And do you what? think that it's an opportunity for for Republicans to, to show contrast here? Yeah, I mean, I could care less for the partisan politics of it, to be honest with you. And I could imagine, and I've been very critical of Biden and on a lot of things, but I could imagine it being a Republican sitting in that seat that would do the exact same thing. So this is not really a particularly partisan issue. It was a Republican that actually was in the White House in 2008 when I think the ignominious bailouts of 2008 played out as well. I could care less what you call it, bailout, schmailout, backstop, schmackstop, it doesn't matter. Okay, It's effectively rewriting the rules ex post after the fact to be able to save a darling in the game of, you want to call it what the actual name is, whatever you call it, it's crony capitalism. And I think that You know what? You want to change the rules, change the rules prospectively for everyone. Fine. Say the FDIC cap for any depositor is high. Fine. But you know what Silicon Valley did? Kudos. And I say this sarcastically, but kudos to the people who managed to actually hold the nation hostage on fear of a bank run. If you actually, if that's what you cared about, you would have dealt with that separately. You would have dealt with that separately by prospectively adopting policies that made sure the other banks across this country didn't have a bank run. But instead of throwing spaghetti at the wall for every argument and seeing what sticks from competitiveness with China to saying that these are the engines of the American economy to saying that, you know what, how about making a poor risk management decision and recognizing that you actually have to own it? Now, the argument that these startups are somehow going to disappear because their cash balance disappeared, that is false. Because you know what? Their business model today is the same as it was three weeks ago, presumably. And if that's the case, great. That's an opportunity for somebody to inject fresh equity capital. I know that sucks because if you're a founder or if you're an existing venture investor, that means equity dilution. But that isn't the scope of concern, I'm sorry, for public authorities in this country to use implicit or or derivative taxpayer money to backstop, as they say. But that's exactly what happened here is in the name of this false myth that these businesses were going to disappear. No, the the business model was sound. Great. Just you have capital. you, You lost balance sheet capital. So be it. Take equity capital in. That does that's that's not great if you're a founder. It's not great if you're a Series A investor. But you know what? Life does it comes with accountability for the mistakes that you make. And it was a risk management mistake to concentrate in Silicon Valley Bank in retrospect. And so this existential threat and fear mongering was unfortunately successful in delivering a result that I think will throw kerosene on populist flames already going raging across the country. Where do we see where do we see the these populist flames take us from here? I mean, is there gonna be conversation about the role of the fed about the role of the executive branch uh the role of the fed would be a the role of the fed would be a productive place for it to go at least and i and i i I don't favor uh you know just fostering anger for the sake of fostering anger if we can marshal it towards something productive let it be towards actually reform of the federal reserve and where i plan to take the energy behind this and hopefully lead the way on it is actually to have a federal reserve that goes back to restricting its scope to using the dollar as a unit of measurement and stops playing God because you know what, if it's been playing God, it's been a very uh, fat fingered God that has actually gotten a lot of things wrong over the course of the last 20 years, over the course of the last two years, over the course of the last six months. And I think that in many ways, wherever you are in the debate about 
what should have been done here with respect to Silicon Valley Bank. I think we can all agree that the Federal Reserve's, uh, you know, I would say, you know, fat fingered problem of its inability to actually play go- its self appointed role of financial god in America is part of what got us here and part of what got us to the, I think, the precarious position we're in, even from a GDP growth standpoint. So then, that would be a productive place to channel the energy. Yes. You know, and the other place that I want to, I've always wondered where you stand on this. And it's something that I think a lot of people, because you were talking about populism, I think it's a very popular belief, which is this problem, and you mentioned it very eloquently, this problem came from Greg Becker and and a lot of the banks lobbying to roll back Dodd-Frank. But that only works in a world where Citizens United uh, and, and, you know, would love to understand your thought about thoughts on Citizens United. And, you know, if you were president, would you remove the money and the lobbying? Is, is that something that you would commit to? So, look, if I could wish it into existence, and I've said this since February of 2020, capitalism and democracy should not share the same bed. We need to execute a clean divorce. I said that for the first time in to- February 2020. I'm sticking to that, too. So. All that being said, you know, the Supreme Court has held and it's on First Amendment grounds that there's some complexities because otherwise people could reorganize themselves as as media corporations because everyone recognizes that media corporations need to have certain latitude in order to be able to engage in political speech. And that creates a domino effect that makes for a complicated constitutional question. But put the constitutional question to one side on first principles. Do I want a world in which laws are made without heavy handed lobbying or even light handed lobbying? Absolutely. Do I want a world in which businesses go back to focusing on making products and services for customers, social adopts? Absolutely. And also, on the flip side, get politics out of the hair of, of businesses as well to let the actual free market work. And right now, when you force capitalism and democracy to share the same bed, you're left with neither capitalism nor democracy, but a perverted form of both. And I just think what happened today is just yet another example of that on full form, full frontal display. All right, I'll ask you more directly. Uh, so if the legislature could get their act together and brought something to your desk, would you sign it? That would it would require, it. So, so if you take Citizens United seriously, it would require a constitutional amendment. But if you're asking me, am I for a system of reform that gets lobbying and, and sort of the paid system of buying up legislation fixed, I'm absolutely in favor of it. Yes. Perfect. And, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, what is transpiring now moving forward, we're going to have a few weeks of tumultuous market. We're going to, this is going to have significant ripples. What is your biggest concern about this decision in the in the next, you know, not just in the next week, which I don't think anybody can predict unless you have a clear prediction. No, but, no it's hard know, to say. Yeah. You know, what do you what do you think the negative outcome of this is going to be? We're obviously dealing with uh, inflation being stickier than expected. The Fed is trying to use a blunt instrument to solve this problem. Seems like their blunt instrument may not be working. They're probably, I mean, at least according to the experts on the stage, they're probably going to become more dovish. There's going to be less rate hikes or less impetus for rate hikes because they literally broke the system. So now, moving forward, are we in a period of Jimmy Carter-style stagflation? Like, where are we going? I mean, what is going to happen? What is your prediction? What are you preparing for? Well, I'm not doing this as a political analyst, right, or, or even an economic analyst. I'm running for president to change the outcome for the better. And I just think if we reorient our energy towards actually delivering GDP growth, that involves a deregulatory agenda, that involves unleashing American energy, involves doing a lot of things that are near and dear to my heart, then I think that we can grow our way out of these otherwise very difficult trade-offs that we're going to have to make. And so I just think that it's shocking to me. It's part of the reason I'm running for president is that I don't hear either major political party actually being ambitious towards just putting us back to, I'm not talking about something crazy here, just four plus percent GDP growth, even three plus percent GDP growth. If we get to three and a half percent GDP growth, you know, we're, we're sailing for the, for the promised land and then some. That's what but our what economic about agenda inflation along the way. I mean, we can get GDP growth if we just pump a bunch of money into the economy. We're seeing, we've seen that, that story before. How do you balance inflation, especially with our balance sheet, Biden just came out with what he's claiming is going to save three trillion dollars over the course of 10 years, a new budget, new proposal. But it's raising taxes on, according to them, the rich 
And so, you know, uh, that's well, we have a model. Place. We have a model for how to do this, right? Reagan and Volcker, right? You have to raise rates. Okay, raising rates is yes, tightening and pulling money out of the system, fine, but do it against the backdrop of an aggressively deregulatory and unapologetically, let's just say, American innovation driven agenda. I would say that with the way we treat our energy industry, both traditional fossil fuels as well as nuclear energy, is exhibit A for the degrowth agenda, the anti growth agenda in America. So if you raise rates against the backdrop of taking that agenda for granted, you're right. That's a formula for tough times. And it's unclear that the Federal Reserve is going to be able to, on a reasonable time horizon, even curb that inflation, even through the monetary policy itself. But if you have the, necess the necessity of tightening monetary policy against the backdrop of actually fundamentally unleashing the American economy through a combination of deregulation, and I use the energy sector as just an example of, of what we need to be doing sector-wide then I think that, yes, we have the opportunity to grow our way out of the problem. And I think that a big part of this also just comes from, you know, the restoration of even this idea of American self-confidence in the next generation of Americans, in workers in this country. I think that that's part of why my campaign is centered. Yeah, I have a lot of economic policies we're going to be rolling out over the course of the next, next year. But I think this is fundamentally about reviving a missing national identity centered on the unapologetic pursuit of excellence. And I think that's one of the things that we miss as Americans. We have to apologize for the unapologetic pursuit of excellence. That's what the anti-growth agenda is all about. That's what the anti-nuclear agenda is actually at its core all about. And, and so that's why I've, start, I've started the campaign. The whole premise is on actually reviving a national identity center, not on victimhood but on the revival of merit, on the revival of meritocracy, on the revival of excellence itself as the heart of American identity. And I think that if we're able to revive that sense of cultural self-confidence, the economy will be one of the places where that manifests itself. But I think that the productivity that we drive through then, let's get to the reform, reform of the Federal Reserve, reform of you know, the Energy Department, reform of the EPA, reform of all of the constraints that stand in the way, the administrative state, the three-letter alphabet soup that represents a set of handcuffs on the American economy. That's really, I think, when we go in that order, when we're going to be most likely to be successful to say that, you know, a GDP growth makes the other debates seem small by comparison from spending cuts to higher taxes. So one part hey, of hey, uh, just, that just we're looking at right now VX, is Dobless so, claims. Kim, one second. Uh, so, you know, one part of this that, you know, I've heard you speak about and I would like to get your thoughts on is right now we have high inflation still inflation is sticky fed has been ra raising rates we have broken at least a couple of banks that probably were weaker uh, than others but we also have one other part of this the fed came out and has said multiple times that they would like to minimize the pain but the only pain only way forward is by you know getting rid of these you know uh, right now we have the the record low uh, jobless claims. And so, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, is the answer. And one of the answers, we have too many jobs, not enough people to take those jobs currently. And so, you know, one part of this is immigration policy. Again, Fed is likely going to be dovish. This is not financial advice. I don't think Vivek is even claiming it's for financial advice in any way, please. But, you know, likely Fed is going to be dovish. Uh, moving forward, especially in the in the wake of everything, what do we do in terms of immigration policy? How do we think about immigration? We don't have enough working people to meet all of these jobs, especially in certain sectors. How does immigration policy play in this? Vivek, you're muted. Yeah, thank you, thank you, man. I'll, I'll give you uh, so I'll give you two tidbits here, uh, and then I, and then I got to rock and roll. And thanks again for having me, guys. But you got it. So, so, so one is on immigration policy, and then one's actually on education policy in the Department of Education. But let me address immigration first. I unapologetically embrace meritocratic immigration in America. Right now, I don't even talk about illegal and legal immigration because I'm you know hardline against illegal. We have an accidental system of immigration, right? I think we need to talk about accidental and intentional immigration. I embrace intentional immigration. Accidental immigration, I mean, even the legal accidental immigration is like H-1B visas. Why on earth would we subject that to a lottery when we could just meritocratically pick the people who we actually wanted to make those contributions instead? And so, you know, I, I depart from some of my GOP, you know, fellow, fellow, uh, you know, let's just say people in the Republican Party on this one. I don't believe that we should have and fetishize a hard cap on the number of people who come in. We should instead start focusing on what kinds of people actually come in and apply an unapologetic points-based meritocratic system. 
And, and I think that it's not just about immigration, though, using to fill the gap. I think the last thing I'll say before I leave is this is an underappreciated con contributor to the worker shortage is actually the Department of Education in this country. So I, I have been expressed, and now, you know, I think a couple of others have uh, adopted my stance a few weeks after I first announced it, which is that mm -hmm. I would shut down the U.S. Department of Education. There's a lot of reasons behind that, but one of them is that the Department of Education effectively tilts the scales in favor of four-year college education for a gender studies major in California or whatever without at all offering the same incentive to somebody who wants to be a welder or a builder or a plumber or a carpenter or whatever for two-year education. And so we're contributing, you, you get what you pay for, right? And so the $80 billion that flows through the Department of Education is actually tilting the scales, worsening, exacerbating the actual worker shortage that we also have in this country, because a big part of it is itself the product of training. So that's not an all-encompassing answer, but it gives you from immigration to education, you know, the worker shortage that you see in this country, that's not, that's not, the, that's not the problem per se. That's just the symptom of a deeper problem of policies and a patchwork of policies that created it. And frankly, I think you got to have a president who understands that in depth, not just somebody who's reading up what they learned in a binder before they, <laughs> you know, showed up on a Twitter Spaces, uh, which is which is normally the way of learning presidential campaigns work. So, yeah. Anyway, thank you guys. Uh, Vivek, Vivek, and, 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 uh, uh, Vivek, before Vivek, you Vivek, jump off, Vivek, uh, I want to say one, one quick thing, Kim, and uh, sure. just two seconds, Kim, you if you don't eat. mind. So, David. Hold on, Kim, if you don't mind. Um, so, so David Sachs just put out a tweet a couple of hours ago criticizing you. If I get him onto this space, I'll see if he can join. Are you free later today to join him as well? Um, I'll I DM you be. if you I are. I think I'm supposed uh, to be on I'll, a show with him tomorrow, so I, you know I'll, I'll be I'll have at it with him. But you know, oh, I, perfect. I think that, It'll be good to I watch. Think, you know, the faux free marketeers are really what bother me the most. If you're, if you're a true free marketeer, great. If you're an anti-market person, that's fine. We can have the debate. But but those who are clouded by self-interest and proximity to otherwise, you know what, I, I think David would, I'm certain he would agree with everything I'm saying if it weren't for the fact that he had a little bit of a proximity bias, but good guy, you know, and, uh, and, you know, and, and from one, a lot of one more point, Vivek, one more point, I ask this for every special guest that we have, your thoughts on Twitter spaces, you know, we've been doing this for a few months. It's uh, pretty cool, A man. lot of great it's, names joining. It's, it's pretty intense here. and live, huh? Yeah, and I know, I know, you years, joined a few but, months ago for the first time. Yeah, I haven't been on any other ones. I've only been on yours, so I can't really say it. But you're pretty proactive about like letting me know when there's a good one. So uh, my experience is maybe it's a selection bias, but uh, but so far, man, it's pretty good. And I think it could be better than um, you know just the traditional modes of media or even you know the new podcast direction that the society is going in. This is an added way to you know keep it real. So anyway, I love cool, it. Man. And um, you know the, the campaign world is still done pretty old fashioned. So I wish I could do something more innovative <laughs> in terms of digital technology, but you still got to go to the website, Vivek2024.com. Uh, and you know what? If you disagree with me, that's great. I think we need more debate in this country. But if you like even part of what you're hearing, you know, like I said the other day, throw in a dollar, chip in a, chip in a buck, and that actually helps advance debate in this country. It'll give me a good spot in the debate stage. So thanks, thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate, thanks, it, guys. appreciate you joining. Uh, and, and breaking news, I know Kim wants to jump in, so I'll give the mic to